Welcome to this course in investments. My name is Mike Yest. I currently teach at Tulane University, where I also received my PhD in finance and specifically investments. In addition, I've had the privilege of working within the brokerage industry with high net worth clients for the past 15 years. I'd like to start this course by first talking about a general introduction to investments and also a general discussion about rates of return. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain the motivation behind investing, discuss expected versus realized returns, give a basic definition for risk, identify the components of required returns, and then calculate those required returns. And lastly, you should be able to compare realized nominal and realized real rates of return. When we think about investing, there are many types of investments out there. This course is going to focus on common stock, but there are many more beyond that. Things like bonds, whether they be corporate bonds, government bonds, fixed income bonds. Mutual funds are a great way to diversify your investments. Certificates of deposit and savings accounts are the typical avenues that banks offer you. But above that, some of the things that perhaps you may not think about are an investment could be private lending, collectibles, whether they be art, coin, cars even, real estate, business ventures, anything in which you invest something and hope to have a positive return down the road. Well, just why do we invest? Investors make a conscious trade-off between current consumption and an expected level of higher future consumption. Rationally, you're only going to invest if you have the expectation of a positive return. If you expected something was going to give you a negative return, then you'd be just as well to take your money, your hard-earned money, and go ahead and buy some real assets. Go ahead and buy some of that nice t TV or something you've been uh, hoping to get. Otherwise, on the expectation level, you want to invest in something with a positive return. Now, in a realized world, of course, after the fact, we can make some bad assumptions. Some risk can come in that we didn't uh, count on, and that can lead us to negative, positive, or a flat return on our investment. Let's start also with a basic definition of risk. Risk and return always go hand in hand. We're going to more concretely define risk down the road as we do the calculations. But I want you to think of risk as the chance of what you expect, perhaps not equaling what actually returns. Any time that actually can happen, that the chance that what you think is going to happen may not occur, that's risk. And what this means is that risk is not necessarily the chance of a bad result. You could expect a 10% return and end up with a 20% return. That's good to you in the end, but because it wasn't what you expected, there's risk involved. It just as easily could have been something less than that 10%. A risk-free investment, then, must have the condition that these two things are equal. Anytime you are guaranteed that what you expect and what actually occurs are the same thing, that defines a risk-free investment. Most investments, however, are of the risky variety. When you think about putting your money in an investment, there's a certain required expected nominal rate of return that you have in mind. It's not arbitrarily thought of. There's a, there's a process behind it, and there are three general components. You need to be compensated in a variety of ways. Before you put $1 into an investment, you first must be compensated for what we call the real risk-free rate. And why do you think of this as like the time value of money? To stop you from consuming today and to lock up your money into an investment over some time horizon, one year, two years, three years. In addition to that, you must be compensated for what we call the expected rate of inflation. If you delay purchasing something today, but there's a general increase in price over the next time horizon, you need to be compensated for that because it's going to cost you more down the road when you pull your, your assets out of the investment. These two put together are called the nominal risk-free rate. Oftentimes, this is proxied by a treasury bill. You can look up and see what that rate is uh, in any paper or on any sort of an internet search. These two components tend to affect all investments the same, meaning they're, they're a base rate. You should at least, when you're facing a risky investment, uh, receive or expect to receive this nominal risk-free rate. On top of this, and this is where people make their bread and butter in the industry, is analyzing the risk associated with an investment. We call it the subjective risk premium, and that can be tacked on top of the first two elements. Together, then, all three of these build up your required rate of return. Well, how do we calculate it? We can calculate it in two ways, an approximate method and an exact method. And they're both getting to the same idea. The approximate method is quite easy, simply adding th these three components together. 
the real risk-free rate plus the expected inflation premium plus the subjective risk premium. Those three added together give you the required rate of return. In reality, there is a compounding effect between the first two components. And so the exact method actually takes one plus the real risk-free rate times one plus the expected inflation rate. And that product, we then shave off one, and then we tack on the subjective risk premium to that. Now, when numbers are small, we're not going to have much of a difference here. When we're dealing with very small different rates in these three buckets, we're going to be fine. However, as they get larger, the difference between these methods gets greater, and so it's important to know both of them. Let's go through a quick example to see what this means. Let's suppose that the real risk-free rate in the economy was 3%. I'm just giving you that. that. That's like the time value of money. Also, you find out that a survey of 100 leading economists indicate that the expected rate of inflation is about 2.5%. So you're going to use that input. Furthermore, after your analysis of a particular investment, we'll call it XYZ, you assign an additional risk premium of 5%. The hurdle rate, or the required rate of return, before you put $1 into XYZ, is that it must meet this required rate of return. And for you, for this analysis, it's the 3% of that basic rate, that time value of money, plus the 2.5%, plus the 5%, or approximately 10.5%. That's the approximate method. Just add them together. Using the other method, the exact method, we would take the 1 plus the 0.03 times 1 plus the 2.5%, that product shave off one, add on that subjective risk premium, and you'll see it turns out to be 10.575. Very close. If these numbers were 9%, 10%, and 14% that we're trying to combine together, we would see that we would have a much different dispersion between these two. But for argument's sake, we're going to stick with the approximate method in many of the numbers that I pull because they are quite close here. Let's think about what this 10.5% means. Again, the approximate result that I'm pulling off of the previous slide. For this particular investment, XYZ, it means that we will not invest our money in it unless we expect. Right? We are before the investment. We are thinking about putting our money in over the near, the near term. We will not invest unless we expect to receive that 10.5. We call this a nominal rate. It's a nominal rate because there is an embedded inflation calculation in there. In this case, it was 2.5. So in general terms, the difference between nominal and real rates, this 10.5% is our nominal rate. We expect about 2.5% of that to be eaten up by inflation. That leaves you the real return from the investment. You expect to earn about 8% after factoring out inflation. Now, we know that unfortunately, at the end of an investment, the realized rate of return could be more or less than this. That is the definition of risk. And if you'll once again keep in the back of your head that for this investment XYZ, we did all of our homework up front. We came up with a 10.5% return that we would expect upon it, that we were requiring before we put our money in. And that led us to about an 8% expectation in real terms after inflation. Let's suppose that we did invest. Let's suppose that we did indeed earn our 10.5%. We're very happy. That nominal rate came through. But inflation, once again, one of these variables that we may have uh, estimated incorrectly, let's suppose it ended up being 7% for the period in which you invested and not the 2.5% that you expected. What then is your realized real rate of return? The focus here and the goal here is that after the fact, you might actually get what the nominal rate is that you had demanded or required, but inflation can help or hurt you.